receive the call to worship. For our call to worship, I would present to you the portrait of those and the words of those who are worshiping in heaven according to the revelation of Revelation chapter 5. Here, what goes on in heaven, the words that are uttered. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Beloved congregation in our Lord Jesus Christ, may we in our worship be lifted up to the portals of heaven and be those who are given this foretaste of what it is to be those who are born again and who have this wonderful hope of glory forever in life eternal in the fellowship of the Lamb. Receive God's blessing. Grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Lord through the working of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's continue our worship in song number 282 in the Psalter hymnal. Let exalt the Lord, his praise proclaim. Let's sing stanzas one and three, the first and the last of 282. Together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe a holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. 
Amen. Continue our worship in song number 291. And a prayer, deliver me from evil, versification of Psalm 140, the three stanzas, 291. It's a privilege to be in the house of God again on the Lord's Day, and we pray the blessing of God upon the congregation, not only all those who may be visiting, but also those who may be tuning in, listening in on the radio. May the Lord bless you, and we pray that you would also attend to the means of grace in a local church where you can hear the Word of God and join with us all as we are so glad for these special means of grace. Lord, bless us now as we join in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that now your, your house, this place, which is of nothing in itself, may nevertheless be sanctified by the Word of God and by the prayers that we make, by your presence and promises fulfilled. For you have promised that where two and three and even more are gathered in your name, There you will be also in the midst of them. Lord, we plead this promise. We expect your presence and we thank you for visiting this place, ruling over this place and our hearts and all the worship, the elements of worship as we seek to honor you. For Father, that's why we're here again on the Lord's Day. We're here to honor you, to hallow your name as Jesus says is our first concern as those who are in the fellowship of grace and to pray. Hallowed be thy name, Lord, by all of us, each one of us individually, so that there's no hypocrisy here, none who take the name of God in vain here, but so that there's this true setting apart and acknowledging of the name of God as alone most worthy of praise. And that name We know is Lord the Lord Jesus, and we pray then that you would be hallowed in him, in the word that we bring, in the worship around the word of God that we sing and that we hear preached and that we uh, receive blessing from. Lord, speak to our hearts and comfort our hearts. Console them with this word from heaven and console them with this great thought that even in our activity, 
the activity of mere earthlings and sinners, you would be exalted. This is our ardent prayer, our fervent prayer. In this place, Lord, be exalted. And among those who may be listening in, be exalted, be praised. And the name of Jesus be so mighty to save sinners and to continue to save the saved. We pray, Father, give us peace, give us joy in the Holy Ghost. Yea, thy kingdom may it come in our midst in answers to the prayers we make and as the word is promulgated here. We pray to focus on the gospel, the good news of salvation for sinners, the good news of the connection of faith that Jesus gives to us poor sinners who were joined by birth in Adam and hopelessly lost in sins and under the tyranny and dominion of sin and death. We pray that that gospel may be clearly shouted from this pulpit and heard so that there is this power of which we'll never be ashamed, even the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. And Lord, we pray that your kingdom may come in all the world. We're just a small part of your kingdom and of its coming. God, we pray, cause your saints to pray everywhere and in every place. And the church to gather that invisible body in visible places so that it can be known that there is a God for whom others or many live, the God who is unseen and yet known and revealed in his word, in the Bible and in all creation and in the hearts of men. We ask, Lord, your kingdom to come because it's a wicked world and we want your justice to be known. We want it to be known that the wicked will not go unpunished and we pray that you would cause your justice to be known even in judgments on the earth at this time and as we speak so that, Father, the fear of God can be in this place and restored once again even in our nation, if that be your will. And, Lord, we're mindful of the decadency and apostasy of a nation that seem to have been founded on such better things among such people who loved the Lord and who sought a place here to be free to worship in the name of Christ. And now no longer, in this pluralism of society, the devil's having his way. You know, there be false kingdoms set up even in America, some semblance of righteousness and goodness. We know, Father, if it be not grounded on the principles of truth and the word of God, these are fakes. These are shams, these are shimmeras, these are nothing but the work of the devil who would get people away from the true gospel and salvation of the Savior. We marvel, Father, at the same time that there's this semblance of righteousness and mercy and justice among the high in society and among the ones who seem to be in the majority, at the same time, there's the promotion of the death of the unborn. There's the injustice that's done. There's the promotion of the wicked lifestyles of many who call this good and who claim the name of liberty in their pursuit of debauchery. We marvel, Father, that there's peace and peace and the cry for peace and there is no peace. There never shall be true peace unless the Son of God gives it. And even in the church, we marvel. There's so much that seems to be done in the name of Jesus and even have a semblance of good. And Lord, we, we shake our heads that there is this good at the expense of truth and so that mercy and truth are not together and the cross of Jesus Christ is not the center of the message of the church anymore but a social gospel, a gospel like the various clubs bring, the various altogether human societies promote. God in heaven, we pray, may the light shine and the true people of God in the true church be not ashamed simply of bringing the truth 
and bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit of truth, no matter the cost, and though it even be the shedding of blood. We pray to go on here at Sovereign Grace United Reformed Church and to be faithful, if nothing else, to be faithful and fruitful, Lord, in thy good way and time, so that others can be joined to our midst who are seeking the same thing and the praises of the same one and the confirmation of faith through the means of grace. Lord, bless, we pray, and all such who would call upon you in spirit and in truth. We ask for your help upon those who are in straits and dire straits at this time, those whose health may be failing, and those who may be caring for those whose health is failing, whether loved ones or neighbors. We pray, Father, care for all of your people, wherever they are, afflicted in one way or another. And even, Lord, among the wicked who renounce the gospel at this time, show by your mercy such to such as should be saved, who are ordained to eternal life, the unconditionality, the freeness, the generosity of the saving grace of God, something you've shown to us, Lord, something that inflames us to be bearers of the word, testifiers of the truth, no matter what. And Lord, we hear tonight presently of the martyrs, the martyrs even in heaven, who are those who cry out for deliverance, who cry out for vengeance upon the heads of those who have persecuted them unto death. We, we fear and we tremble as we would open this word. We pray, Father, for your spirit to preach and to hear and to be those then whose faith is built up. Lord, even as we go to heaven in this word from heaven, the Apostle John received this glimpse of heaven. May we ourselves also be lifted up in the trials and burdens of life, the heartaches and even the desperate situations in which we must walk. Lord, give us to taste and see that you are faithful, you are on the throne, and all is well. In Jesus' precious name, amen. We worship the Lord at this time in the giving of our offerings and the glad privilege we have for that. May the Lord bless us as we give to the cause of Christ represented here. In our Psalter hymnals to two number, uh, 294 and numbers 1, 5, and 6. The first and the last two of 294.
Let's take our Bibles at this time and turn to Revelation chapter 6 and the first 11 verses. Revelation chapter 6, the first 11 verses, which is the revelation of the opening of the first five seals by the Lamb of God, who is the Lion of God, on the throne in heaven. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a loud voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering, and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see, another horse, fiery red, went out. And it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked. And behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. What follows, verses 9 through 11, is the text from my sermon, the opening of the fifth seal. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, was completed. Thus far we read the word of God, May God bless us as we receive this word read, and now as we hear the declaration of the word in the preaching of the gospel. And as I said, beloved, the text before us in Revelation 6, 9 through 11 is the record of the opening of the fifth seal, part of the vision that the inspired apostle John was given, uh, which is the vision really of all of history since Christ has come especially and then as he comes in glory all history long since he's come the first time in humility and finally shall come in great glory and power at the end of the ages. I say this opening of the fifth seal is a part of that general vision that God uh, God gave to John in the giving of the entire book, which we know as the Revelation. But also, this is in particular, this part of the Revelation that deals with the opening of what are called the seals on that book that was sealed until the lion, who was the lamb, even the exalted Lord Jesus, is designated and appointed and empowered to open those seals. And he is the one who is worthy, in fact, to open the seals because the opening of the seals of this special book is a symbolic representation of the execution of the counsel of God throughout time for the glory of God, the fulfillment of his plans, and especially for the redemption of his church and the new heavens and new earth. The word of God, Jesus Christ, is the one who is worthy to execute the counsel of the Word of God. And as we saw in sermons prior in this series, in the sermons that dealt with the openings of the first seals, there were those first four seals, highly symbolic. There's a white horse symbolizing 
the conquering of the gospel throughout history. There's the red horse, symbolic of the wars that uh, are those that accompany all of this history. The black horse of social differences and conflict. The pale horse symbolizing generally death in all of its forms. And now there's the fifth seal. The fifth seal that the Lamb of God is given to open. And it's the seal depicting souls under an altar. And evidently, these are martyrs who are slain for the word of God and the testimony of the gospel that they held. But note here, these martyrs are in misery, as I would describe it, for they're crying out loud and long for vengeance upon their souls, upon those who have murdered them. And so I would entitle this theme, because I think it's the theme of the text itself, the miserable martyrs, or the miserable martyrs of heaven. First of all, we want to consider those souls under the altar and the idea of martyrdom and the uh, historical manifestation of that. Secondly, we want to consider their prayer, but also their apparent and even real misery. And finally, we want to consider the answer that the Lord gives and the peace that they are given in the answer. We have souls here, according to Revelation 6, which are under an altar. And they're those who have been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Now, what's this all about? Well, in the first place, I want to say at the outset here, remind us of this principle of interpretation that we've been following here, and namely, that we're not going to forget that this is a vision. John is given a certain way of seeing things here and a certain depiction of the reality of things in a vision. It's like a dream when one is awake. And it's not exactly then the kind of revelation that God gave to the Apostle Paul in which the Thessalonians would read over a cup of coffee or something like that. But here is John taken up into heaven, not in a trance really, but what we would call a, a vision. And he's seeing things that I had not seen, nor either ear heard, nor hath entered into the hearts of men, these wonderful things that God has prepared and is preparing for us. And so we have to be careful here that we interpret the vision in light of itself and in light of the symbolism and of the, the metaphor that's used here. And, and we not, not to strain uh, at things, to try to squeeze out doctrines and different interpretations to satisfy our curiosity. Often it's the case when we're asking the wrong questions, as we can do, when we have these visions here, we come up with the wrong answers and Wrong answers, even if their answers are nevertheless wrong. We can ask ourselves, for example, the question all day long, how it can it be that John sees souls, bodiless souls? How can that be? And again, I would say that's the wrong question to ask here. Just believe that they're souls. They're real people who nevertheless have lost their bodies, even in this case in, in martyrdom. But John sees them. Again, it's a vision. But then a second thing to remember here is the theme of this whole book. And if you look back at chapter 1 in this glorious vision that John got of the exalted Savior, it's all about the exalted Savior's coming again. As he went in the clouds of glory, he's coming again in the same glory, in those clouds that depict the glory of the Son of God. And so that's the idea. We want to see here, what does this tell us of the coming of the Son of God? Of God, And then some details to boot, because God would give us just what we need for our edification with regard to the, the axillary things, the things that are related to the coming of the Son of God. And everything, again, according to our principles of interpretation, understanding the Bible, let's compare the clear things of the Word with the other clear things, and so we come to a right interpretation of the not so easily understood things of God, and we will then not be straying from what's called the analogy of faith. 
We won't be losing the Trinity, for example, because we're wondering about what those souls are. We won't be denying the gospel of free grace, and we're talking about these martyrs who are slain for the word of God. Well, that by way of introduction, but here we have an altar. An altar here, which I believe is symbolic of the altar of burnt offering that was in the Old Testament. The word here <clears throat> speaks to us of sacrifices that were performed at this place, and John is using or receiving visions of things that he might otherwise be acquainted of, that altar where sacrifices were given in the Old Testament in the outer court, and which symbolized the reconciliation of the people of God through the blood shed of an animal, sacrifice made, and also the consecration or dedication of that offerer to the cause of God. He would be pledging his life and his service to God. It's not here, I believe, the altar of incense. There was another altar in the temple because at the altar of incense, sacrifices were not offered. But here we have again this word that alludes to blood sacrifices that were offered. Blood, in fact, was poured out by the animals or of the animals into a large basin and collected under the altar. Well, John sees here not blood of animals, but souls, the souls of saints under the altar. And those souls who are there because they've been slain, we could translate literally butchered, for the word of God and the testimony, the witness they gave of the truth of the word of God as it is in Jesus. These are killed, in other words, as a human sacrifice to the cause of Jesus Christ. Not that by this they were reconciled as if that uh, was the ground of their being right to God, but because they were dedicated to God, they offered their lives a living sacrifice and then even a uh, sacrifice unto death for the cause of Jesus Christ, uh, the Savior. And so the fifth seal, I think it very plain, is this revelation of martyrs. Martyrs not just in the sense that people testify like we all do, but martyrs who go unto death to testify of the worthiness and the veracity of the worthiness of the Son of God. They're butchered for Christ's sake. In fact, that's what the text reminds us of. <clears throat> These ones who are slain under the altar are there for or on behalf of the word of God and on behalf of or for the testimony which they held on to, which they gripped. That's why. That's why these are there under the altar crying out. That's why there's martyrs at any time in the church of Christ. Now, you think about that. That's an amazing thing, amazing truth here to the glory of God. God is such that his cause is seen to be so worth it that people will actually live for and die for it. This is what's brought out in this text. These men, in fact, were not naturally that way, and these women, it doesn't say that they were just men, their souls could be children, children, men and women and children, souls slain under the altar. Be that as it may, these themselves are naturally not like that. None of us is. As we saw this morning, we're born in Adam. And there's a connection with Adam and all mankind that's under the reign of sin, the dominion of the terror of death. And in this reign of sin, in this dominion of death, nobody wants to live for God. Nobody believes the word of God, just as Adam and Eve denied the word of God and the sincerity of God's um, threat that there would be the punishment of death should they disobey. That's what these people were by nature. They weren't born super saints. No, something happened to them. I'll tell you what happened. Look back at chapter 6 and verse 1 and 2 and following. They were themselves conquered by the word of God. You see, before they championed the word of God, the word of God, symbolized by the white horse conquering and to conquer, going throughout this world, taking over the place, that word 
had its way with them. You see, these souls here are the souls of believers. These are the souls here of those who, to whom God came with the truth of the gospel and called them to repent, and they were born again by the mighty work of the Holy Spirit. And the evident, the first and, and first fruit of the evidence was that they fell down on their knees and they repented of their sins and they, they flew to Jesus. They believed in Him. They died to self. And they lived in Christ from that day forward and then continually. They were those who championed the Word of God. Oh, isn't that what we all must do? Who are visited by the Word and who are those who are born again. We ourselves love that Word. That's the idea, I believe, of the fact that they were slain for the Word of God and for the testimony which they held. They, they held it. They held it. Not just even in their hands, but in their hearts. They loved the Word of God. Every Word of God. They loved the time that they had to be holy on this earth. They loved the time at lunchtime when they read the Bible instead of going out and just kicking back and resting before the work began again. They loved the sweet hours of prayer. They loved the quietness of a walk and talk with God. They loved this word because it told them of hope which they didn't have before. They loved this word so that in every square inch of their life and for the sake of Jesus Christ as the Lord of all, they would claim every square inch of this world for Christ. It's the word that had its way with them. And they were never the same. They were never, never the same. And so they testified of the Lord. They held the word. They testified of it. They were like witnesses in a court. Let's say that all the world were the judges of their conduct and of their words. They testified the truth of God as it is in Jesus. They testified in the salvation of sin that's only in him. They went about glory in the cross and, and boasting in that of all things. And, and they loved the fruit of the Spirit that was born in their garden, even their desolate garden, upon their desolate nation or, or nature, the seed is sown, the seed is born, and, and in spite of their weakness, they just love the fact that they could be fruitful unto God. They were like the Old, uh, Old Testament prophets called Navim, Nuvi'im, and that's what the prophets are called. And that word for a prophet in the Old Testament signifies a boiling over, boiling up and a boiling over. The idea of the prophets and their prophesying was that God would speak to them and fill them with his word. And like a pot, they'd be filled with this word that was full of life in itself and bubbling over so that they could not help but speak it. And that's what these martyrs were. So as Jesus said, it's a requirement. You confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. These went beyond it being a mere requirement. They thought it a privilege. They said, you're not speaking the word of God? Let me! The rocks and the stones are going to shout, but I don't want them to lead the way. Because I love God. I'm not just a creature of God. I'm a lover of God. And he loves me. That's what they said. And the contents of their testimony was Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Always speaking of his cross, always speaking of his death and resurrection, always speaking of his coming once in humility and of his coming again in glory, always calling sinners to, to believe in this and to, to understand the reasonableness of faith. So Isaiah, the prophet, they spoke like him would say to the sinners, come, let's reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. That's what those martyrs were like. And that brought them conflict. That brought them conflict. Doesn't it always? It did for them. 
they spoke the truth as it is in Jesus, they were not liked. Just as when the white horse goes forth conquering and to conquer, not everybody believes the white horse and the rider of the white horse, the preachers of the white horse, the people of the white horse. In fact, most don't. Most reject the gospel. Most say, oh, forget it. But they feel a little guilty. So what, you know what human beings do. Try to hide the guilt by substituting something that looks like the righteousness of God. Some kingdom that looks like the kingdom of God. See, the devil is an ape or a mimic of God. And he holds out the temptation that we shall be as God. And his antichrist agent at the end of time And for all we know, he could be among us. And there are many antichrists in this new dispensation. They're they're great at mimicking what is good, but luring the real people of God, they try to, to believe a fake gospel, a mirage of truth, some paradise on this earth, some carnal representation of the real spiritual salvation of God. That's the way of the devil, children and young people college students, to substitute something very, very close to the Word of God. Very, very like what the gospel sounds like. They want you to hear. Something that sounds like truth may be truth, but it's only part of the truth. Something that sounds like love may be partly love, but which has its cost the compromise of truth. This is the way of the devil, but even more, the faithful witnesses keep on speaking against that kind of stuff because that's what the faithful witnesses did, no doubt, in heaven. That's why they got killed. They speak against all this fake Christianity, all these fake preachers, and all this fake representations of truth. They get it. And salvation, uh, or judgment, I should say, according to the prophet, begins in the house of God because it's especially, especially the religious organizations and even the apostate church that leads the way in the persecution and martyrdom of God's people. It's the way it was in the apostles' day. The apostate Jews crucified and killed the apostles And indeed, the government also contributes to this at the time of the Roman Empire uh, Empire and the Roman emperors when they were against Christianity. They they killed off the people. But before the Reformation and during the Reformation, since the Reformation, wherever there's been God's people holding fast to the word of life, there's also been the false church leading the way and undermining the witness and even getting God's people killed for the sake of the gospel. And it shall be at the end of time, increasingly so, I believe. People, when you read about the description of Antichrist in Second Thessalonians 2, will worship the beast, and they will be part of that great harlot, that fake bride of Christ, that comes out of the earth and of the sea at once, joining itself a political and religious power that would squeeze the people of God off the face of the planet. If there's anything the false church hates, it's the true church of Christ that's always testifying against the unrighteousness of a compromised gospel and a fake presentation of the Savior. And so these martyrs, we don't know how they were martyred, but they were. And we do know as well that they prayed in heaven. And this is the picture we get at them, my second point. They cry out here. <clears throat> they cry out with a loud voice, a unanimous uh, word and a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. I find this remarkable, but I want to remind ourselves and me as well that this is a vision. Reverend Dick, remember, this is a vision. Let's interpret this with balance here and let's uh, not 
go uh, all over the map and, and try just to be uh, cute or whatever else we want to, to be according to our sinful nature. We want to be balanced here. Otherwise, again, we ask the wrong questions, get the wrong answers. But questions come up, don't they, with regard to this? I, I hope they do or shall as I go through this and I share my questions with you. Though I don't want you to question so that you doubt the Word of God, but my question I have right away is, how in the world can this happen in heaven that people aren't happy? Because obviously, these martyrs, they're crying with a loud voice, and it's not just, you know, dispassionate, not, not anything in there. They're crying out, Lord, how long? In agony, misery. How long, holy and true Lord, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? not happy. How can that be in heaven? Further, it seems like they're sinning, doesn't it? They're impatient. The Lord has to say, hold it, to say, wait, 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 just a little while, just wait, just like we get impatient on earth, but they're in heaven. Besides, it seems like they're crying out for the vengeance of which Jesus said, hold it. Don't you cry out for vengeance upon your enemies. Pray for their salvation. Do good to your enemies. He calls a fire on their head, but do good to them. Don't pray for vengeance and fire from heaven to call upon them. What's going on here? Seems like he might even have some kind of a justification, according to Roman Catholic theology, for this teaching that there's a kind of purgatory here. I don't know. Some kind of misery Miserable existence, something that's not quite right here. But again, I'm bringing myself back in front of you, and I did in this week of preparation, and I want us to be brought back to the symbolism that this all is, representing some basic truths here, and a symbolism and a text that's to be interpreted in light of what we know clearly, in light of the rest of the Word of God that heaven's about. First of all, it's a blessed state. These martyrs are blessed, symbolized, as we'll see presently, in the giving of the white robes. They're blessed. And every one of God's people who goes to heaven is with the Savior in paradise. Is blessed. Your mother, your father, they die in the Lord. Your loved one dies in the Lord. They're in the blessed communion of God in Christ Jesus. It's blessed to be there, and far better to be there than to be on this earth in the state of perfection. So they're blessed, and so can't be talking about sin. No, there's perfect sanctification there. It's the end of sin. I do want to say, though, that the way heaven is presented to us until the final day and the renewal of all things And Jesus comes again, and every tear is wiped away, and every sigh flees away, and they're sighing in sorrow no more. Till then, there is kind of an incomplete, completed state, or an imperfect perfection, something of which um, the writer to the Hebrews spoke of when he was speaking of the the imperfection of the saints who had died before the New Testament saints had uh, been added to the church of heaven. Uh, or Hebrews 11, God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. The idea is that the Old Testament saints had to wait until the New Testament saints got to heaven for them, for themselves to be perfected. I think the idea here is the same. There is an incompleteness about heaven right now. How else can we describe the fact that Hebrews also tells us that Jesus in heaven, in heaven, in the glory of his Father, is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He's touched. He's moved. There's some angst in him. I speak as a man. So the saints there with him are sensing, and this again we can't 
draw dogmas from this. They're sensing something that's not right on earth that has to be right on earth and in heaven for God to get the glory. And that's what I want to bring out here especially. The saints are concerned that God get the glory. The saints are concerned that there be this vengeance of God's enemies or upon God's enemies, which happen to be the enemies of the church. You see, they're not going against Jesus who was warning against us seeking personal vengeance. Rather, they are taking the side of God Almighty himself who is just, and they're praying to the Lord here, who, and the word for that is despot. It simply means the sovereign one, but it's a reference to Jesus Christ, who is called in chapter 3 and verse 5, when he addresses the church of Philadelphia, the holy and true. You see, they're addressing one, the Lord Jesus, who is the Lord and who is holy and true, that he might execute the counsels of God on their behalf, but especially on his so that he would be glorified in the just judgments that are awaiting those who refuse to repent of their persecuting and killing off the people of God. That's what this prayer is all about. They're appealing to Christ's holiness. Do you know what, people of God? When you pray, children, when you pray, it doesn't matter what you're going to pray about. Really, it doesn't. People have asked me, can we pray for our dog? Can we pray for our house? Can we pray for this? Can we pray for that? I say to them, you can pray for whatever you want as long as you're praying for the God of glory to be exalted. Then you're going, your, your prayers are going to be shaped then. And then whatever you want is going to be what God desires and reveals to you. But be that as it may, your concern is for the holy and the true. See what the martyrs do. They were faithful to God. In Jesus Christ revealed, the holy and true Messiah, would they not be just as faithful in heaven? The same kind of prayer. Your name be honored, holy and true. Revelation of God, I am that I am, creator of the universe. Be exalted in this thing called justice. That's what they're doing. Oh. You see, they knew something we have to know. When we are persecuted, and all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall be persecuted, but when we are, it's because of Christ in us, not because of us and our holiness, but of Christ's holiness in us, Christ's faithfulness. That's why, that's why. And so it's all about him. It's not about us. It should never be about us, but only about him. And so those souls, they cry out. The wicked seem to be prospering. They are, so many ways. They reject the word of God. They prosper as they trample on the church and as they, they would snuff out the light of the testimony of the gospel and church by church is, is then made to go into the woods or something. And they seem to be walking on the heads of the martyrs to gain the ascendancy. They cry out. And I do believe there's something like misery here. That's why I call these folks les miserables, the miserable ones. You want to know what misery is? Holy misery, it's the misery of a people of God that wants above everything God to be praised. That's holy misery. And it doesn't seem to be getting done. And again, it's not about us, but holy praise and holy consecration, willing to die a thousand deaths for God, and not seeing God's light shining as brightly as we want. That's our sorrow. Heidelberg Catechism reminds us who are here below 
that we have great sins and miseries here as we struggle in the Romans 7 existence. The good that I would, I do not. The evil that I would not, that I do. That misery is understandable among sinners. Something wonderful and pure is the misery of someone wonderful and pure for God's sake. This is angst, this longing, this hoping for the day when God will be seen as God and no one then will dare say, I'm an atheist. Liar. You're believing in yourself. No one then will be so smug as saying, well, I'm an agnostic. You know who that was a long time ago? Yours truly. There won't be any of that in the day of days. I'm an agnostic. You know what that is? I hedge my bets. God shows me a little bit more of himself. Maybe I'll put my investments into this God in Jesus Christ. But meanwhile, it might be this other God is a God and so on. That's also a liar's testimony. Because that liar is smug about his own investments and his own wisdom and being shrewd and balanced, not overboard about one God. The souls cry out and they're miserable and no one seems to know. We wouldn't know unless the Bible revealed that there was this kind of misery, this holy, hoping Godly, longing for God, misery in heaven. But after all, there's only one thing that matters. God knows. And that's my final point. God answers. Don't you think he would? Children, does God ever not answer your prayers? He always answers our prayers, doesn't he? How much more the prayers of these loved ones of his. He answers in a twofold way. First of all, he gives them a robe. Want something? Maybe, maybe you might be wondering why God just gave them a robe, first of all. And at least that's how the, the order of the text reads. Then a white robe was given to each of them. And then he didn't say anything, apparently. But maybe he said it right with the giving of the robe. We don't know. But can you imagine if you're praying out long and all God does is give you a white robe? And if you didn't know what this was all about, you're saying, well, we want an answer, God. Why are you just giving us a white robe after all? I mean, come on, we want an answer to our prayer. We're in angst and we're crying out loud. And what about you? You're just giving us a white robe. Well, be that as it may, at the same time or soon thereafter, I am sure, it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. Well, I want to say to you, people of God, that there was something of an answer in the white robe. God spoke volumes in that white robe. You know what he said? He said, I love you. This is an I love you robe. This isn't the coat of many colors that someone was given a long time ago. This is the coat of one color. And it symbolizes the glorified nature of God's people who partake in the innocence of Jesus himself. It symbolizes they're clean. Now, isn't that the one color then you want to have, people of God? White. White and all the dirt wiped away. And all the guilt taken away. That's what it symbolizes. First of all, our justification in the blood. And then secondly, close with it, the holiness we have. And then as well, the victory as the white horse symbolizes that conquering and going forth to conquer gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're given to partake of that color. The martyrs are. And later on in the next chapter, we read of the fact that also all of the saints are given the same white robe. So you see, in the midst of the misery, there's this wonderful blessedness. Blessed eternal life and victory with God forever. That's something. And then they're told, wait a little while. We should rest a little while longer. Just, just wait, wait. 
Don't cry out and, and uh, ruin your vocal cords or whatever. Just wait, wait a while, till both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. What does this mean? I think simply it means wait until all of the other martyrs will have died, and then there will be all those persecutors and all of those murderers, some of whom may very well have repented, but we're not talking about them, but all of those who stay in their unbelief and they imagine that they can defy God to the end, then I will show my wrath. Not until then. Just as God will not come again until the very last elect is gathered into the fold, so God will not come again in judgment until the very last martyr is martyred and then God will come and judge all the killers of the martyrs. That's the idea, and that's the answer, I say, of great, great peace to the martyrs, not only, but also to us. This answer, I want to say to you, is not to be found anywhere but in the sacred word of God. You imagine, this is an amazing thing that we're here in this church and we're here hearing, preaching. It's a very old thing, you know, since time began. And in the new dispensation, God has given preachers to preach. And God's people ears and a heart to want to hear. And they come and they visit the church of Christ and and. And they, they love this means of grace because they get to hear things of heaven, things of eternity, and things that lift them up in their spirits and life and give them impetus to go on. And so this is what we need to remember here, to hear this. And that we don't need to go anywhere else to augment this kind of hearing or instead of hear so that we might maybe learn something of the human condition and the revolutions among men and of the miserable from the bijou and from the movie theater so that there we're really going to get enlightened but not here. Preaching has fallen on hard times and that's why I believe there's so few martyrs because there's so few godly people who hear the word of God. The rest of us, we're just in the world and becoming like the world. I fear. I fear for my family. I fear for myself. I fear for the congregation. We're just becoming like the world. I wonder if this word even makes sense to us. We're, we're so eager to get to the football game and to watch this and do that. And, and we're so busy in the rest of our life that we don't have time for the word of God. What is it, people of God? What shall it be? What's precious to us? What has come and conquered us? Or are we conquered by the world? To all of those who get what I'm saying and who are ashamed, because I am, let's seek to bear witness, shall we? Let's seek not the things below, but the things above. And let's hope in the white robes and not in the latest of the fashions to get us a standing among men. And then finally this, for all of those who are seeking to bear witness martyr-like, we're not running off to the Colosseums and elsewhere just to get martyred. But for all of us who would live unto Christ and die if necessary, hear this word of comfort. You know who opens even this seal? Last I knew, because the Bible tells me, Jesus opens this seal too. The fifth seal. Martyrdom cannot come unless Jesus allows it. The witness of the word of God, in fact, follows upon the riding of the white horse, which Jesus certainly is in control of. 
the preaching of the gospel. Jesus has ordained it that way. Jesus is in control in all authority and power of the Holy One of God is His. That means all is well. That means though we bleed and though all our blood is drained out of us as we hang there on the rack, He is the one who holds every drop and every hair of our head is numbered. Not one shall fall except it be the will of our Heavenly Father, whose will the Son does in perfect communion in the fellowship of the Holy Ghost. Thanks be to God. The miserable ones shall be miserable no longer very soon. And soon the sorrows of this present life on the behalf of the gospel, suffering, little outcast for Jesus' sake, it'll all be taken away, and God will get the glory in justice and in mercy. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that we ourselves may be as those who gave their lives the testimony of the truth of the gospel in Jesus. We pray, Father, to receive this word of God, shamed at our lack of witness, but empowered, encouraged to carry on, to be brighter lights, to be those who articulate the faith, sometimes with words, always in our deeds. In Jesus' precious name, amen. <clears throat> 465, I'm a soldier, am I a soldier of the cross? Good question to ask. Let's sing stanzas one and four, the first and the last of 465. God's blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.